just before this moment, uh, Duke Frederick has come into Rosalind and Celia's uh, private space and told her that she's banished from the kingdom. Um, within, she's got 10 days to get herself uh, at, least, at least 20 miles from the kingdom, otherwise she's going to be banished. And, um, and then he leaves the room and Rosalind and Celia are left to deal with this information. Let's look at what's driving the characters in this scene. Um, I think what's especially interesting as a theme for the whole of the play is banishment and exile. What are our first instincts about um, the way Rosalind and Celia respond to the potential for death if she's going to remain in the court in this moment? I think Rosalind's very fearful and is almost paralysed um, by fear, I think, particularly in this moment. Mm. Um, and almost in a, in a, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And f I think feels very alone in that she believes that this, this punishment has been exacted on her alone. Yeah, and I, and I think Celia almost feels the opposite and she feels it's happened to her as well. That, that because Rosalind has been banished, well, of course I have. Um, and that Celia's focus is maybe a little less on banishment and more on Rosalind in banishment and Rosalind in death and Rosalind in fear. Yeah, great. Making sure she's okay. What's going to happen to you? Great. So I'd just like to pull out a few of the words that you've just uh, pointed to yourselves, yeah. which is death, mm. fear, punishment, mm. um, feeling alone. Um, and so what if we try a version of the scene that's about playing those aspects and of, of how the characters respond and playing them to their extreme. Okay. Let's see what that does to the scene. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Whither shall we go? To seek your father. In the forest of Arden. Alas, what danger shall that be to us? Maids as we are, to travel forth so far. Beauty provoketh thieves sooner than gold. I'll put myself in poor and mean attire and with a kind of umber smirch my face. The like to you, so shall we pass along and never stir a sailor. Were it not better that I did suit me all points like a man? A gallant curtilax upon my thigh, a boar spear in my hand and in my heart. Lie there what hidden woman's fear there will. What shall I call thee when thou art a man? I'll have no worse a name than Jove's own page, and therefore look you call me Ganymede. But what shall you be called? Something that hath a reference to my state. No longer Celia, but Aliena. Oh, the cousin. What if we essayed to steal the clownish fool out of your father's court? Would he not be a comfort to our travel? He'll go along over the wide world with me. Leave me alone to woo him. Let's away and get our jewels and our wealth together. Devise the fittest time and safest way to hide us from pursuit that will be made after my flight. Now, go we in content to liberty and not to banishment. You really get that sense of urgency in the scene yeah. and yeah. the time pressure um, that we need to work out what to do now. Yes. And that sense of not having, not having, not having time to think too much about it. Yeah. It really heightens the stakes of the scene. Yeah. I think what's really important is that death is in the room, that the Duke has left the potential for Rosalind to die in the room and Rosalind quite quickly goes into herself and feels very isolated and alone at the beginning of the scene and so if anybody's driving the scene I think in many ways it's Celia and it's Celia who at the beginning of the scene is asking the questions. It's really interesting to, to look at the questions in the scene um, it tends to be Celia at the start of the scene who's saying, oh, my poor Rosalind, whither shall we go? Shall I change fathers? Uh, don't be more aggrieved than I am. And you've got these sort of quite 
negative, I would say negative statements from Rosalind, I have more cause, that he hath not, almost somewhat defeatist. And it's then in the middle of the scene where you see them, a sort of a change in her, and she starts to ask questions. Whither shall we go? What will your name be? So as soon as Celia starts to activate her into a more, I think, active, positive place of, come on, let's make a decision, let's do something together, Rosalind then starts asking the questions. I'd love to try a very different version of the scene now that's about playing the extremes of freedom, choice, active, um, opportunity, yeah. adventure, excitement. If we can play those aspects of the scene to their extreme, let's see what that does. Whither shall we go? To seek your father in the forest of Arden. Alas, what danger shall that be to us? Maids as we are, to travel forth so far. Beauty provoketh thieves sooner than gold. I'll put myself in poor and mean attire and with a kind of umber smirch my face. The like do you. So shall we pass along and never stir a sailor. Were it not better <laughs> that I did suit me all points like a man? A gallant kirtle act upon my thigh, a boar spear in my hand, and in my heart. Lie there, what hidden woman's fear there will. What shall I call thee when thou art a man? Oh, I'll have no worse a name than Jove's own page. And therefore, look you call me Ganymede. <laughs> but what shall you be called? Something that hath a reference to my state. No longer Celia, but... Aliena. Ah, but cousin, what if we essay to steal the clownish fool out of your father's court? Would he not be a comfort to our travel? He'll go along over the wide world with me, leave mm. me alone to woo him. Let's away and get our jewels and our wealth together, devise the fittest time and safest way to hide us from pursuit that will be made after my flight. Now, go we in content to liberty and not to banishment. <laughs> <laughs> What came out in the text really clearly then was how they listen so well to each other and inspire each other and provoke each other. And I could hear the questions in the scene. The question, what shall we do? Yeah. Oh, what if we do this? Yes, and, yes, and, yes, and. And whenever in a scene, especially in Shakespeare, you feel like the characters are saying yes, and before it. What that does to the scene as a whole is it drives it through right to the end. So you feel like you almost get that crescendo at the end of the scene. And then what sticks out so beautifully are the, the words liberty, to liberty and not to banishment. That the scene begins in banishment but ends in liberty. I feel in that way um, when people are making choices not out of fear so in this instance, they're together, they're bonded. You know, in the, in the other one, when two characters are both in a land of fear or negative, it, they're sort of separate because it's quite an insular emotion. Mm. Whereas in this one, um, building, building on each other's text yeah. allowed us to feel closer as two characters. Yes. I think the other thing I heard really clearly that time was how important the renaming mm. of themselves is. Yeah and how exciting that is for two young women to be able to choose their own names. Yeah. Especially in a society, in, a, in an Elizabethan society, and in a play where we never hear about these two women's mothers. Yeah. What would be really interesting, and, maybe, and I think what we've come to in our version in the production is a mix of these two. Because yeah. Yeah. Um, I loved what we got from the first version that was about how serious this is, this yeah. is and about the importance of death in the room and how high the stakes are yeah. and the choices they make in terms of arming themselves and mm. the dangers heightens these characters' courage and the courage it takes for them to make the choice they do. But I also love the spirit and the ownership mm. of the second version that really helps us understand their relationship and how they bounce off each other. And how resourceful they are, I think that highlights that, how 
like you say, that they turn something that is so scary and so serious mm -hmm. into something positive and yeah. uh, driven by strength. Yes. Yeah.